Okay, welcome everybody to our Ask an Astronomer live stream, finally, after a few minutes of technical difficulties. We are here to answer all your questions you have about science, the universe and everything. Um, I'm Stefan, and uh, today with me I have my guest Tom. We are both from Hi. the Institute of Astronomy at the University of Cambridge and we're PhD students. And uh, maybe you want to start, Tom, by saying a bit about you and what you're studying at the moment. Yep, so I'm a fourth year PhD student in astronomy and I work on stellar evolution in particular evolution in binaries and triples and uh, multiple systems in general. Yeah, and um, so you c we are should now be online on both, uh, or on um, Periscope, which you could see about Twitch. So if you're, uh, if you're looking at Twitter, you're probably using the Periscope stream. You can click on that link to go directly to Periscope and log in with your Twitter account, and then uh, send us questions in the chat there. And um, you can also use uh, YouTube and chat to ask questions or the Twitch chat. They should all be displayed in the top right here. And um, you should, we should see your questions and we'll answer them. So just ask us anything that comes to your mind, especially if it's about astronomy. Um, and yeah, you can also see other links here at the top. So and while there are like a few slides running in the background, um, let's just talk with a few questions that were already submitted to us uh, previously. So we got a question on our website. Um, What's the most distant object in the solar system? Uh, what does it mean for Voyager 1 and 2 to have left the solar system? Maybe you want to say something about this, Tom? Yeah, so I guess the interesting... Um, so firstly, I'm, I'm not an expert on, on the solar system itself, so uh, just an advanced warning. But uh, I guess the problem is that the edge of the solar system isn't very well defined. It just kind of fades out into interstellar space, and eventually, we assume, you'll fade into other stellar systems when you get close enough to them. Uh, I guess what will be a good definition of the outer edge of the solar system, or the furthest objects in the solar system, are the objects found in the Oort cloud. And this is a, we think, roughly spherical cloud of debris. Um, if when they get close, we, we'd call them comets, uh, that surrounds the sun. It's about one light year in radius. So it extends a, a decent fraction of the way to, to our nearest stars. It's about a quarter of that distance. Uh, so I guess that would be yeah, the most distant ob objects in the solar system. Uh, the question asked about Voyager, right? Yeah, and Voyager, Voyager 1 and 2. Yeah, so we've seen, I, d I don't know how many times I've seen it in the past few years that Voyager has left the solar system. It seems to have happened at least five times. And I guess that's a good way of demonstrating how badly defined this boundary is. Uh, I think particularly the boundaries they're talking about are the the interaction boundary between the sun's magnetic field and the solar wind and the interstellar medium and the interstellar magnetic fields that dominate it. Uh, you get a, a sort of shocked region that delineates the two, and that's, I think, what they're talking about when they talk about voyages leaving the solar system. So does this boundary kind of change with time? So could it be that it kind of left the boundary and the boundary expanded and it had to kind of leave again? I, I can't imagine it would change that quickly, uh, but yeah, I'm really not sure. Especially the other thing about it is I think if you're defining it this way, you wouldn't expect it to be spherically symmetric at all. So whether or not it's left the solar system should depend on which direction it went in. Ah, yes, right. That's a good point. But specifically with Voyager, I believe these are in reference to measurements taken by the probe. So it's not just, oh, it's this far away, so it must be outside by now. There, there is something physical. Okay, okay, that's, that's very nice to hear. Um, while we're at the, in the solar system, kind of on, on our more kind of scale close to up and we also got a questions about micrometeorites and if they're dangerous for satellites orbiting the earth or if they are maybe dangerous for the international space station so yeah these definitely do pose a threat to to our man-made objects in space uh, and it's essentially just to do with the the speeds involved so when when you're in low earth orbit uh, you're traveling at around eight kilometers per second so it doesn't take a particularly large object to do serious damage to, to well, anything there. I think they have, they have problems with uh, particles slightly larger than a grain of sand on something about mm -hmm. the size of a pea would be what it would take to substantially damage the ISS. Yeah. But I think these things, they're, they're bombarded with a constant stream of the very small stuff, like dust, uh, to the point that it actually, I think in the case of the ISS, it actually starts to build up on, on the panels. Oh, okay. So you kind of it's like a, in a, in, a, in your room when like the dust st dust starts building up on on yeah. the surface, just kind of different. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure exactly what causes that. It might be uh, an electrostatic thing. 
Oh, but, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think there was also a new story, like, kind of a few months ago, um, where there was kind of a hole in the ISS that was probably caused by some object flying through it, although I think it wasn't entirely clear. Um, no, I don't think... I'm not sure it was. Um, but yes, I, I don't think it was really... It, it wasn't a really, really big deal, I think. The origin of the hole was. No, I think it was plugged with tape. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that, that's what they do on the space station. Yeah. I mean, it, it worked. That's so. why you have duct tape. Yeah. Also, hello to the, to the first viewer from YouTube, and thank you for the comment. Um, if you have any questions, just uh, let us know in the comments, and just, just write something, and we'll talk about it. Um, so in the meantime, maybe we can... Uh, we got another question uh, from Reddit. Um, I'd like to hear about the expansion of the universe, um, the rate of expansion, and what it means for our galaxy. Um, so maybe I, I, I should say a bit about like, kind of the universe expanding. I think you should be the one to talk about this one. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, I'm actually I'm, I'm doing cosmology, so I'm looking at how the universe as a whole evolves, how it expands, what its future and its past. Um, so we know that our universe is kind of expanding as a whole. So everything that we see that's kind of reasonably far away is flying away from us. And the further it is away, the faster it's kind of moving. It's, it's getting away from us. So that's what we call the Hubble, the Hubble law. Um, and we can observe this with like Rabi's measurements. We can see supernova that going off in the distance and uh, we see that the further they're away, the more they kind of, um, yeah, like the, the, the further away something is, or the, the older it is, uh, which is kind of equivalent because the light takes many years to reach us. Um, we see that the universe, we can measure kind of how fast the universe was expanding at a different uh, time. So actually, let me just quickly, because it's not really that nice to imagine without a um, curve, show you kind of the measurements of the, of the um, brightnesses that we have from supernovae. And what you what you would imagine if the universe would be just constant, that the further away su supernovae is, the darker it is. But actually, we see kind of a curve that's curved that tells us how the universe ex is expanding. And so what we found out is with these supernovae measurements is the universe expanding and it's expanding faster and faster. And now um, the question is kind of what does it mean for us, like for Earth, for our solar system, for the galaxy? Um, I would say the answer is kind of on the one side, um, it's nothing dramatic happening because we will never like kind of get ripped apart from the sun from the like we will always kind of stick to the sun and the sun will always stick to the milky way and actually not like we won't be alone in the milky way also kind of the neighboring galaxies of the local group so andromeda and the milky way will crash no matter how the universe expands so kind of we will stay together but um distance galaxies that are far away from us that will expand and expand more and more and at some point we will not be able to see them so the universe will be really will get really large and vast, and there will be kind of small islands in there, which is one of which will be our galaxy and its kind of neighboring galaxies um, that don't get, get changed, but um, kind of are there alone. Um, we got a question from YouTube. Um, can you give an idea about the Kepler data set of exoplanets and where I can get them? So do you want to say something about, about Kepler? Yeah, well, so specifically about, about the, the data sets, uh, you can actually access and download any of this data online. Uh, NASA runs a web page called the, the NASA Exoplanet Archive. Um, and yeah, so I haven't actually used this before, but taking a quick look at it now, they have a, a list of all of the Kepler-detected exoplanets. Sorry, it's, it's not just Kepler, but also it's a TESS, which is a, another exoplanet-detecting mission. And you can browse the database on there and uh, take a look at all, all of the properties they've calculated for all the planets. And uh, just like any astronomical table, you'll find a lot of blank columns <laughs> uh, where it's yeah properties that we haven't managed to calculate yet. So the problem with this data is that uh, you don't always get a complete picture of what it is you're looking at. And you'll only be able to work out certain things like... Uh, Kepler, for example, is very good at calculating orbital periods because you just wait and see uh, when the planet comes back round again. But it's uh, less good at calculating things like, um, let's see, things like the inclination of the orbit. Uh, so it's kind of where, where, how it's oriented with respect to its star. You can usually get some information, but, but not always. Yeah, so I guess this is related to kind of the different me methods of your, how you detect exoplanets. So I, I just also pulled up this, the slide on this. Um, so what, what kind of detection methods is Kepler using? Is it like focused on a certain method or is it using various kinds of methods? So Kepler is uh, relies on transits. 
So it basically just measures the brightness of the star, uh, or measured because it's uh, it's no longer going. Right. But uh, it measured the the brightness of the star at some fairly fast interval. I've forgotten exactly how fast. Um, and waited until the planet passed in front of the star, blocking a fraction of the light. That's basically the same thing as as you'd get with a a lunar eclipse, a solar eclipse, or when you see transits of Mercury or Venus crossing the sun. Uh, and then from the amount of dimming, you can estimate things like the size of the planet. And by seeing how often the dimming happens, you can work out how long the planet's orbit is. Um, yeah. Yeah. So that's that's kind of a kind of a good set of, of, of ideas you get. And then I guess there are like other methods that um, can give you kind of complementary information, right? So if you have like you, you could look, for example, at, at the star and see how the star wobbles when the star when the exoplanet moves around it. So like the star doesn't like the exoplanet doesn't just orbit around the star, but the star and the planet orb orbit around their like common center of mass, and um, the center of mass isn't exactly in the in the or it might be might very well be in the planet in the sun or in the star, but it's not in the center of the star. So doing this orbit, the star kind of wobbles a bit back and forth, and this movement changes the frequency of the radiation sent out by the star. So it kind of changes a bit. Well, you could say the color, but it's really a small change of the star. And if you can measure this, so you just look at the star and see how its frequency changes, or some lines of the spectrum of the star, you can deduce if there was a planet and how far away it is or how massive it is. And if you combine this with information from, let's say, Pe uh, Kepler, you can learn quite a lot about the particular exoplanet system. Yeah, did you want to go back to that uh, uh, plot you were showing on the yeah. stream a second ago? Yeah, it's there again. OK, so you need, need a second. For me. Yeah, so you can see the points here are colored by the detection method. So the, uh, the transits, which are where you measure the brightness of the star, those, those are in green. And the radial velocity, which is measuring the wobble of the star, is in a not very colorblind friendly red. And you can see the, those are dot, those, that plot's a little out of date, I think. There's, there's not a huge number of dots on there. Yeah, I think I have to update, update this one. <laughs> Yeah, there are a few other a few other ways of detecting planets, but those two absolutely dominate dominate the field. And but you can see from this plot that the different colors cluster together, and that's just because different methods are better at finding planets in different places. So I guess the transits are better for kind of more massive planets, or well, more kind of for to, to kind of faster planets, right, to shorter orbits. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so it's it's biased towards shorter orbit it's just because of the geometry if it's far away from the star it's much less likely to cross in front of it oh okay and it's if it's farther further away then also the orbit is longer off so yeah. kind of longer orbit also means further away and that's why there's this difference yeah mm -hmm. and there's uh, you also get fewer transits if you know so ne neptune's orbit is about 150 years so there's you're very unlikely that kepler would have spotted neptune if it were pointing at the sun yeah so i would have to stay at this for a really long really long uh, time okay yeah um i mean while we're talking about kind of kind of life and and exoplanets uh, well, what what's your your thought about if there are if, are we alone in the universe um are there are there maybe other planets um where, where there's life yeah i think uh among astronomers i don't think about this very much or or i i, I don't have a strong opinion on it um yeah, yeah. I, th I think we're like kind of more more busy with the actually let's find planets and let's not think about too much if there's actually life or not. Well, I don't know. I feel like a lot of people looking for planets are pretty convinced they'll they'll find life eventually, and I'm pretty sure that we'll find very good analogs of the Earth. I'm less convinced there's life on them. Yeah, yeah. Well, maybe maybe we can uh, one day reach them and <laughs> and and settle them. Yeah. Let, let's see. What, what what do you think? How long? I think we're moving we're moving into a stage now. I think where we'll be able to, if, if there is life there, we'd stand good chances of detecting it. So we're moving towards a, a point where we'll be able to start ruling out planets. Oh, OK. At least for, for life, similar to how we find it on Earth. Ah, yes, yes. Yeah, actually, like, talking about this, um, do you think, like, in any of the, like, any of the planets on the solar system, or let's say maybe also moons, uh, are any of those kind of candidates where we could either live or where there could be life in general? Again, with with life, I guess you run into the same issue. Well, that, okay, let, let's not say life. Let's say they're habitable. If if they're habitable, are there any plants in the solar system where kind of humans could could go and live if they wanted to? Yeah, I think 
I think Mars is the obvious choice. Uh, I guess if you're discounting the moon, I guess. Uh, oh yeah, yeah, right. Okay. Well, I mean, Mars is kind of. It, what's the kind of the main reason? Is it because it's so close, or is it also are the conditions there so much better than the other planets? I think it's mostly an issue of temperature with with Mars. Okay. And that uh, Mars at its warmest is, I believe, around twenty degrees Celsius. Mm. Uh, but at its coolest, it's it's pretty cold. <laughs> yeah. But it's not. Uh, you know, it's not minus one hundred, minus two hundred degrees. It's within the range of temperatures that you'd find on Earth. Okay, so it's pretty cold, but not like really, really cold, which is quite a big difference. Yes. Yeah. And then, uh, yeah, I guess perhaps not for, for habitation, but the other places where you might be considering looking for life, and, and they are con and, yeah, they're considering missions to look for life, are uh, Europa, one of the moons of Jupiter. And so this is, uh, this is an icy moon that we are fairly sure has a subsurface ocean. Uh, which is warmed by tidal heating with Jupiter. So that's potentially a good place for life. And the other possible two places would be some of the moons of Saturn, Enceladus, for one, which is quite similar to Europa, and Titan, which has a complete atmosphere. It has uh, an analog of the water cycle on Earth, but with methane instead. So it has methane rain and methane lakes and methane rivers. So... Yeah, if, if life can live, survive there, I think that's a good place to look for it. Yeah. We just got a question from, from Ben on uh, Periscope. Uh, to date, how many X planets? Um, do you just mean how many planets, or is X planets something specific? The exoplanets. Oh, <laughs> uh, never mind, yeah. Um, or oh, do you have any idea how many planets we have found? So the number of confirmed planets is a little over 4,000. Oh. Um, I think Tess has discovered something like 1,500 to 2,000. Um, and I think they're not calling them confirmed until they've detected them by another means or, or there's more time with tests or something. Oh, okay. So it's it's something of the region 4,000 to 6,000 discovered to date. That's nice. Is it, is it going to yeah. like increase a lot in the in the future? Do we have some... I think we have some nice upcoming, upcoming miss missions that are mm -hmm. going to detect so, quite a few. Yeah, so Kepler really is responsible for a very good fraction of those 4,000 confirmed. Uh, I'm not sure what the predictions are for TESS. Uh, so but by comparison, Tess, uh, Kepler just stared at one region of the sky for several years. Uh, TESS is looking at the whole sky. So it will find planets in every direction. But I think as a result, it's uh, rain, it'll find closer planets or planets in certain configurations or something. So it might not necessarily be more than Kepler. Uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm really not an expert. <laughs> yeah, we just got a question, two or 4,000. Yeah, the idea was it's about about 4,000 confirmed, 4,000 and a bit. And there should be another few thousand, like about one to 2,000 coming up from tests that are not yet confirmed, but well, like we're kind of sure. So yeah, um, 4,000 to 6,000. Um, uh, we got another question, uh, how, how we tell how big an exoplanet is. So yeah, so we I guess we kind of touched on this when we were talking about transits. Uh, well, the, so the method where you block out part of the starlight, and when we do that, you can work it out just from what percentage of the starlight is blocked. Oh uh, yeah. Because stars are roughly uniformly bright across their surface. It's not perfect, but roughly. So the the area of the planet will be roughly the area of the star times the the fraction that the star is dimmed, and that that gives you the area. Um, the really interesting thing about that method is that if you look at the star in different wavelengths of light, you can actually work out how thick its atmosphere is, because it'll look bigger for some wavelengths than for others. And th this is really how we, uh, yeah, how we can measure the atmospheres of exoplanets as well. So we can actually like not only find out how big it is, but can we actually find out what's inside the atmosphere to some degree? Yeah, that's uh, generally you'd be more reliant on spectroscopy for that, so oh, seeing okay. which. Uh, which bits of the star's light are absorbed and scattered by the atmosphere. So then I need a kind of a, a better ex experiment to actually measure, measure the whole spectrum of the planet and not just kind of how bright it is. Well, you can you can make do with just the, the brightness measurement because the thickness of the atmosphere will depend on its composition. Ah. So if you have an atmosphere that's made of hydrogen or helium, it will be very, very puffy, very big. 
Mm. Uh, but if it's made of the heavier elements, then it'll be a lot, uh, a lot thinner. And if you know the temperature of the planet, you can then use that to estimate its composition as well. So that's pretty good. We got a nice question about how do we calculate uh, how distant stars and galaxies are. Um, mm -hmm. So that's that's actually really a current like I mean that's a really nice question because currently there's a lot of research going on. There are multiple methods to do this, and they don't. Um, there's a bit of kind of tension because some methods seem to work differently. Well, some methods don't seem to agree with other methods, and we're still trying to figure this out. So in particular for like distant stars and galaxies. Um, one, one thing is always good if you have a supernova somewhere in this galaxy. Um, in particular, there's a type of supernova called Supernova 1A that are always more or less the same brightness. So um, there's a kind of picture illustrating this here on the, on the slide. Um, so imagine you have kind of an event that's always the same brightness, like a supernova, or let's just imagine a candle in your room, and you move it away from you by a certain factor. Let's say you have a 10 centimeter in front of you and one meter in front of you. When you move it kind of a factor of 10 away, the brightness will go down by a factor of 100, so it will seem much dimmer than it was before. And in like you could just calculate the distance to a, to a thing by this kind of change in brightness. Um, although there's a, it's kind of not completely straightforward in cosmology to say what do you mean with distance, because if you think about the universe might be curved and the universe is expanding. So if you have two options with two objects with a certain distance, the distance is changing over time. And when a photon was sent out. Um, at one point, when the universe was kind of smaller, then it's traveling to us, and while it's traveling to us, the universe is expanding. Then the current distance between the object where the um, photon came from uh, originally and us is bigger than the distance the photon actually traveled. So you have to kind of correct for that, and um, you can do that, so you can just do the calculation and use this for distance. And then there are other methods. So, so uh, one thing is, for example, the kind of Tully Fisher relation, which is a relation um, for uh, galaxies and how fast how fast they rotate uh, compared to I think their luminosity or their their size. I think I think it's uh, I think it's luminosity. So you can also use this kind of to um, look at the at the object and then kind of compute how bright it should be, measure how bright it is, and use this to kind of compute what the distance is. Um, and there are many like. Uh, like that's kind of one, just a small fraction of the methods. Um, there's also the parallax measure method, which is something you would use for stars more. And maybe Tom, you want to want to say something about parallax? Yeah, sure. So this is a method that takes advantage of the orbit of the Earth over the course of a year. In that, uh, if we look at the stars in January, and then look again in July, six months different, uh, we'll notice that because the Earth has moved from one side of the sun to the other. Uh, the stars will appear in a very slightly different place. And so by taking very, very precise measurements of where the stars are in the sky, uh, we can use that combined with the fact that we know how the Earth moves to work out exactly how far away they are. Uh, and this is the probably the most effective method we have for measuring stellar distances. And there's a, a spacecraft uh, orbiting, well, it's in space now, uh, and it's currently mapping the entire sky, uh, recording the positions of close to 2 billion stars and yeah uh, yeah recording their, their parallaxes so by the time that mission is done we should have reasonably accurate measurements for the distances to millions of stars which is something we just haven't had at all in astronomy before now so that's that's big news yeah I see we, we also had a question about uh, discovering asteroids and that's a, a really neat side effect of these missions to map the sky with stars, in that you also find an awful lot of things that aren't stars. <laughs> so this, this mission Gaia, um, trying to remember the number, I think it was responsible for discovering 300,000 solar system objects as well, uh, which are, which of course look like stars if you take a single picture of them, but you can see obviously they don't move like stars, so we can then classify these as asteroids. Wow, that's, that's I didn't and, know and that. Gaia, and Gaia found quasars as well. I'm not sure it discovered any. That, yeah, it discovered any, but it found a lot of them. Yeah. Oh, okay. So we got just got to follow up on the on the supernova question. So actually, that's a really good point. So uh, what we notice, what we just notice is, if we look into one galaxy and see multiple supernovae there, we notice oh, they seem to have the same brightness. We don't know exactly why. There are some theories and some relations. So we we kind of find a way to. If we have supernovae at the same in the same kind of more or less the same place, 
we can kind of figure out how um, to correct their brightness to get a reliable number. But we don't know kind of what's the base by brightness. We don't really know how bright a supernova is. So what we need to do is find a supernova that we know how far away it is, and then measure its brightness, and use this then to extrapolate to all the other events. And there comes the idea that um, Tom just explained about parallaxes. We can use those parallaxes, they just work. We can just use them to measure distances of low nearby stars. But the problem is they don't really work if the star is too much, too far away. So if, there, if it is a few galaxies away, we, we don't have any chance of measuring its distance with a parallax. So then there's kind of a second step we can do. Because there is a certain type of star called Cepheid, which is um, varying in brightness. And you can, from, from observing it, you can uh, compute how, what, what is the brightness you would expect in theory. And what you can do is you can kind of build a chain out of these measurements. So what you do, you take a kind of star whose, bright, whose distance you know from parallax measurement, and then search for a Cepheid nearby, or actually maybe measure the Cepheid itself, um, and then see how bright is the Cepheid. And then uh, compare this brightness of the Cepheid, then you know how bright is the Cepheid in general, and then you can compare this to other Cepheids, and can get further away to different galaxies. And now you know how far a few of those galaxies are away, then you try to find supernova in those galaxies, and then you can use this to measure how bright a supernova should be. And then you have supernovae, and then you can go on. You can also add the tully fisher relation or various other things we know. So there's, for example, a thing called the tip of the red giant branch. Um, I think we can talk more about this if you, if you want to know more. But it's related to kind of the distribution and the evolution of stars. And if you kind of combine all those measurements, you should be able to kind of map out the nice history of the universe, how it expanded um, using kind of this chain of, of measurements. And there's actually, there's one other way, or there are a few ways, but there's one main other way of doing this. Instead of kind of measuring from Earth something and going up to that distance, uh, you can use the understanding we have about the Big Bang. So we know early on in the universe, it was kind of very hot and it was all a big, well, you could think about, of it as a fireball. So it was a big kind of plasma and everything was ionized. And kind of pressure waves, you can imagine this like sound trapped at a certain speed. And we can compute this more or less good from kind of our, our understanding of the universe. So we get quite a good idea of what was the sound speed in the early universe and how old, how, how, um, when in the universe this kind of took place. So what we can measure, if we look, um, say, at, at uh, the dis distribution of, of matter in the very early universe, we know that this distribution should kind of be related to the speed of sound times the age at that time. So how far kind of pressure waves or in general, um, any information could um, be transferred in the early universe. This should give you kind of waves that should be visible in the in the star in the star distribution in the galaxy distribution today, which is called baryonic acoustic oscillations (BAO). This essentially tells you, okay, you look at stars really far away, or uh, not stars, galaxies, um, and compare kind of the the typical distance of these galaxies, and you should know what it should be. And then you can see how big does the distance appear, so what's the angle you measure, and use this to kind of get this, this anchor on your distance ladder. And then you know how big this is, try to find supernovae close to them, and then build kind of backwards. So you start from this really far away galaxy that you measure, whose size you know from observing the Big Bang, uh, then come, come um, at the supernovae there. And actually there's a nice picture on, on one of the previous slides. Um, so those things are in, the, in this one paper here that were called late and early route. The early one is using information from the early universe and the late one is using information from the late universe, so today. And they seem to give quite different results. So if you compare the two methods, they don't really agree what the current expansion rate of the universe is, what is kind of the thing you want to measure. So um, that's currently a, actually an interesting topic in, in physics because um, first we thought uh, maybe one of the measurements is wrong, but both measurements went became really good and got really close to like finding all their problems. And now we are thinking maybe there's some, maybe there's something about the universe we don't understand. Maybe there's some new physics and that's really exciting because I mean, that's, that's really a nice thing to research and there might be discover discoverers waiting. So um, yeah, that's a really hot topic at the moment. Um, yeah, Tom, Tom, actually, do you do you know something about uh, tip of the red giant branch? Yes, yeah, so this basically relies on the fact that... General, do, you, do you have a picture of an HR diagram? Yeah, I do. 
Give me a second. Um, here we go. So, so this is a technique that's based off the idea that we have a fairly good understanding of how stars evolve uh, over the lifetime of, of a single star. And uh, we, we put these on a thing called the, the HR diagram, the Hertzsprung russell diagram, which you're seeing a picture of right now. And you can see that the, we find that the stars tend to lie in certain regions of this diagram. And so stars spend most of their, their life on that large diagonal line from top left to bottom right, which we call the main sequence. And as they grow old and reach the end of their lives, they move to the right and sort of up towards the top right hand corner, which we call the red giant branch. And you, you don't see it too well on these yeah. pictures, oh. but that's mostly because uh, this is quite a short stage of the star's evolution. So there aren't actually that many of them. Uh, so you see that it's, it's actually much rarer for a star to be on the red giant branch than it is for the main sequence. And as this star continues to evolve, they become brighter, they become larger, physically larger, and they become cooler until they reach a certain point where, at which point uh, the helium will ignite in the star's core and it will become a horizontal branch star instead, which is a little to the left and you really don't see that on these diagrams. But the point is that the, the brightest point that these stars reach, which is the, we call the tip of the branch, tends to be fairly similar from galaxy to galaxy. And so we can treat the brightest stars in the giant branch as a standard candle, like Stefan was describing earlier, where we know roughly how bright that should be. So seeing how bright it appears to us gives us the distance. And we can check this with other measurements of the galaxy's distance as well. And then we can calibrate it with, uh, with the stars found in the Milky Way too. Yeah. So like, Actually, I think, I mean, if you want to, we can talk, we can talk about this measuring distances kind of all day. There are also gravitational waves and uh, we can use gravitational lensing, um, but maybe we should, we should get to some of the other questions that were, that were sent to us. Um, we have a question about um, black holes orbiting each other. So if, are, if there's a large and a small black hole and they come close to each other, can they orbit each other kind of like, like the Earth and the Moon? And, mm -hmm. and how does it work? Yes. So, well. The one word answer is, yes, they can. <laughs> and to, to understand this, the, the thing that's important to realize is that if you're far away from a black hole, and far away here means for a stellar, black, stellar mass black hole, more than about 20, 50 kilometers, you know, unless you're very, very close. Okay. Uh, the, the gravity from a black hole is exactly the same as the gravity for, for everything else. So and that, yeah, it's it's just completely the same. It's, it's super easy and and just it's, it's yeah, it's not exactly the same, but it's you know, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference uh, if you're if you're that far away. So by the time you're you're an appreciable distance from a black hole, it, its gravity just acts like the Earth's or the Sun's or, or whatever. So the fact that you can have two things orbiting around, uh, yeah, is completely fine and completely normal to how you'd find it elsewhere in astronomy. So so I heard that one oh. yeah yeah. I was going to say one one interesting question is how you form black holes in these configurations. Oh yeah. And uh, yeah, we're not really sure. So we have simulations of how binary stars evolve, but from what we can tell from these, it should be very rare to get close black holes. So it's still something of a mystery as to how you actually get them close enough to merge. So what would happen normally? Like, what would you expect to happen? With a binary black hole? No, with a like binary star. So you have, so you have a star, like two stars that are kind of orbiting each other, each other. Yeah. And then let's say one of them turns into a black hole, goes supernova. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, what like, and then maybe the second one does go supernova as well after some point, uh -huh. or like like why don't they stay and become a black hole pair? Yeah. So when you have a, a stellar supernova leaving a black hole you expect most of the mass of the star to be blown or blasted away by the supernova. And so, you know, so the black hole that's left behind will usually only be a fraction of the mass of the star at the moment it explodes. And the problem is that that mass is then just gone. It leaves the system at some insane high speed and yeah, it, it just won't affect it anymore. The problem is um, the mass is, well, the gravity of the mass is the only thing that's holding the two stars together. Oh. So if you remove a whole lot of the mass, you expect the orbit to widen quite a lot. And generally speaking, if you lose more than half the mass, you'd expect the orbit to completely fly apart altogether and they won't be bound. Um, you can get around this with some science that, well, with an effect that we're really 
not 100% sure how it works, but it's, we call it super, a supernova kick. And that's the idea that when you have an explosion like this, uh, what's, the black hole that's left behind isn't just sitting still in the middle of the explosion, it actually gets pushed in a certain direction. And so you can use this push to keep the two stars bound together. So the, it relies on getting the right random chance. And then if you want a binary black hole, you basically just have to do this twice. <laughs> wow. And that's that's why we expect them to be quite rare. OK, so it, it's actually like, is it, it's, is it surprising to find so many black hole mergers from, from the LIGO observation? Or is it just that they yes. fi like, can see such a long range that they still find enough? I, I think as far as, as far as I'm aware at the moment, uh, the merger rate of black holes is quite a lot higher than we'd expect. Oh, okay. So there's something that's more efficient at keeping them together that we're not thinking of. And maybe it's triples. <laughs> so the, the, the thing is, you can you can keep you can keep the black hole in a pair, but unless it's a very very close pair, we're talking maybe uh, one AU or less, which is the distance from the Earth to the Sun. Uh, actually, it would have to be quite a lot less than that. Uh, the black holes just won't merge in tens of billions or hundreds of billions of years. So they need to start out really close to each other. And that's the bit that we can't really explain with our current model. OK, OK. We got actually another question about um, about black holes merging. So we got a question, if uh, when the light produced by binary mergers is calculated, is it done using Maxwell's equations? Are they good enough? Or do you need to use some special uh, relativistic effects? Uh, the light from what mergers? Sorry? Uh, from binary mergers. So assume it's a neut neut neutron star black hole or yeah. a neutron star neut neutron star mergers. Yeah. So I guess the first thing that's probably worth mentioning is that we don't expect any light emission from black holes because yes. there's, there's nothing to emit any light. Uh, maybe you might see this if there's a disk around one or both of the black holes. You might see something there, uh, but we haven't we haven't yet. Um, as for the emission in neutron star mergers or neutron star black hole mergers. Uh, I assume most of it is uh, it's just black body from the material that gets thrown off. Uh, but these are very, very extreme environments. So I wouldn't be too surprised if you had uh, effects from the magnetic field in the region. I know that for the neutron star merger, they detected uh, emission from heavy elements. So there's some, there's some spectral line emission as well. Oh, OK. But yeah, the, the high energy emission, I'm really not too sure about. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I guess you, yeah. You, I mean, you will, you will probably, do you, do you see like relativistic effects? Like, do you think, do you see things like redshifts of those lines because they were so close to a black hole? Or is it not close enough again to matter? I think by the time you're doing things like atomic recombination, you're far enough away that you wouldn't see that. But I'm, I'm not quite sure. I don't know if you've seen those animations of the neutron star merger where you have the, the merger in the center and you get two huge plumes of material coming out. Oh, OK. Um, and I assume that's where we're seeing the radiation from. OK, so it's again a topic of black holes are actually really tiny. And actually, yeah. if you want to have really like interesting effects, you have to be really close to them. Um, so it's, well, I guess it's also a good thing because we don't like being close to black yep. holes. But um, it doesn't really do a lot if you're not very close. Oh, I think uh, we also got an infl inflation question. Um, how effectively does quantum inflation explain the structure of the universe as we observe it today? Um, and what are like weaknesses and limits of this explanation? Um, so I guess that's something for me again. Um, inflation is a really um, kind of yeah, kind of like a model that that isn't that intuitive in the beginning, but then it just solves a whole lot of problems um, with kind of a simple model. So let me maybe just explain the idea and kind of the reasoning behind it. So when we Let's say we just look at the sky and look in the cosmic microwave background. So that's just a radiation that's coming from the Big Bang, kind of to us, um, from the Big Bang, at, not from like where we are, but from kind of far away. So um, the Big Bang happened about 13.8 uh, billion years ago. So 13.8 billion ish light years away, there's a point where the Big Bang happened, and then this light is kind of flying through the universe and just arriving today. Uh, the 13.8 billion light years away are not really correct because the universe was expanding during that time, but it's just think about it as a, a point that's really far away. And from this point, we see the light and we measure it's about 2.7 Kelvin of temperature. So this refers to the light has a certain spectrum and the spectrum peaks at like uh, one frequency that corresponds to an object that is this cold. And 
we can measure this in all directions of the sky and we measure it's the same everywhere. And that's what was really surprising because you would think, well, why should it be the same? Because those points, like so far away, they never came in contact with each other. If you say the universe just started at time zero and expanded the way we thought, well, naively, then those points would have never time to kind of interact with each other and make their temperature equal. Uh, actually, I should maybe open a picture of the Big Bang uh, of, of this one I'm talking about this. Um, so, yeah, this kind of the, the CMB always looks, of course, now it looks really like there are different colors, but those differences are really tiny. They are one in at one part in uh, 100,000 are those kind of temperature differences between different points in the sky. So the mystery kind of was, why are they so close? And one solution for this would be to say, okay, maybe the universe didn't start the way we think it started, but it started by expanding a really lot. So it was really small, really, really small, <laughs> um, and then ex expanded by hundreds of orders of magnitude to its size, really, like, still far before the Big Bang. And then the usual stuff happened that we think. So the universe expanded, cooled down, and the Big Bang, we, we could see the, the image. And... Um, this kind of like this kind of expansion is called inflation because it's just a really really fast expansion, and if you assume this, then the, the particles would have time to interact with each other, like the different points in the sky, and they were kind of causally connected before, like during this time. They were disconnected afterwards and only connected again, kind of now that we see them. But that's why they could have the same temperature. And then this is one of the problems that inflation solves. But then there are other things like we look out in the universe and see, oh, it's it seems to be kind of flat, which is kind of a property that doesn't isn't given. Like the universe could be kind of a curved surface, which would mean either that you could go kind of, if you would fly in one direction in the space for a really long time, you could in theory like kind of come back. Uh, this would be like a closed universe. This, um, I mean, it's theoretical, theoretically it could, be hap could, could happen. But remember the curvature of the universe is really, really small or just zero. And some some people would think, okay, maybe like, it would be really surprising if it would be zero from the beginning. But with inflation, no matter like if the universe was kind of closed or somehow differently curved in the beginning, this expansion flattens out the universe. And then it's not surprising at all anymore that it's flat today. Another, in my opinion, actually like more convincing um, discovery is that it's a so-called power spectrum. So um, the power spectrum describes how correlated structures in the universe are at a certain distance. So if you um, if you would take a look and compare, if you, ha if you have a look at, at kind of the structure in the universe and say, okay, I look at that structure that's, let's say a million light years away from each other, is there much correlation? Like, is there, if the structure- You want to go back to the CMB picture? Oh yeah, I should. I think it's easy to show with that. Yeah, so um, you think about this, let's say you pick, pick one point in the, in the CMB and pick a point that's kind of uh, close-ish to it. And then you see if you have two points that are relatively close, let's say like kind of the distance between those two points here, then you would expect them to be, um, if the one is a hot point, the other one would be a hot point as well. So you can go around here and usually points that are close by are hot as well. But then if you take a bigger distance, you see this correlation kind of changes. So if I take a distance that is like a few, well, degree, it's hard to describe. Um, like you just think about these two kind of two blue points, uh, uh, this red and this blue point. And if you take two points that are like a few centimeters apart on this picture and kind of compare if the one is hot, is the other like on average hot or cold? And you will find a different correlation. Like it might be depending on what the distance is, it might be negative or, or positive. So they're both hot or both cold or they're one hot, one cold and vice versa. And kind of this correlation is exactly the way it is predicted from inflation. So there are loads of different models and um, there could be models that predict other correlations, but inflation gives exactly this, this correlation that we observe, which is kind of a, a nice uh, effect and which makes inflation quite a um, convincing model. And maybe a bit on the kind of quantum aspect. So the idea is with inflation that in the early universe there are quantum fluctuations. So just um, as we have, like in quantum physics today on really small scales, objects can just be created and disappear again um, due to the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, which allows you to kind of borrow energy from the universe for a really tiny amount of time. And the trick with inflation is, let's say out of, out of nothing, you create a pair of particle and antiparticle, but then the universe expands so fast that they don't get the chance to annihilate again. 
that you just create create stuff and you create just create everything um, from from the from the uh, beginning from the inflation and all those particles that you create then would kind of grow and form the meta that we see today and if you compare this to the observations of the CMB this also works out pretty simply so you just well not, it's not too easy but uh, you can do the math of of the kind of quantum physics and combine it with the expansion of the universe and it gives you exactly the kind of power spectrum the correlation that you would need um, to get this image so that's uh, it's working pretty well and um, of course they like alternatives there are many tweaks you can make to this model because the most simple ones don't work and there are loads of different possibilities a bit of a problem is there's not that much difference between those many different models so it's hard to kind of rule out the one in favor of the other model um, so that's why this um, is kind of slightly hard but it's still a really kind of active field that's trying to um, like come up with the various models see which one works best uh, if you can rule out some of them and yeah it's, it's still active um, yeah maybe um, we can we can come back to the to one question uh, that we had uh, also um, submitted uh, in the beginning uh, if no, actually on Reddit um, how much time do you estimate will it take before humans start to go on inter interstellar journeys so coming back from me talking about the beginning of the universe again to the future um, do you have any any estimates on when will we make our first journey to let's say Alpha Centauri or other stars yeah I'm, I'm not sure really because uh, at the moment we, we have the problem that if we want to do this with conventional rockets you're looking at, I believe, tens of thousands of years. Mm. Uh, so yeah, I'm not sure how likely that is. So if you put, if you, uh, I, I guess, if you if you go join, if you like enter one of those rockets, I guess as an astronaut, you expect maybe future people to overtake you, given that it takes thousands of years. That's, and that's the other problem. So I think for, I'm not sure you really have this problem for chemical rockets so much, um, but for for different technologies, yeah, I think that's probably a real concern. <laughs> Yeah. Um, yeah, the idea that it, you know, if you consider a ten thousand year journey, what what human propulsion technology looked like ten thousand years ago, uh, you you could probably expect some fairly significant <laughs> development. Yeah, let's let's hope that. So I guess sending a human to another star won't be anything that's happening uh, in the near future because we can just probably just expect if it takes ten thousand years to get there, we might as well wait a few hundred years and then have much much cooler technology to send someone there in less than ten less than 9,900 years and um, so it doesn't really make sense to send someone to other stars now but we could of course think about like just sending really tiny probes there so there was a really uh, interesting project i think it's called breakthrough uh, project which is yeah starshot ah starshot right yeah exactly uh yeah anyway they they have a the idea is um so okay, well the general premise of rockets is you have to carry your own fuel which is a really annoying problem so if you want to go really far you would need a lot of fuel, which adds a lot of weight to your rocket, which you then have to carry again. So that's kind of a, the generic problem of carrying your own fuel. So the idea was, okay, what if we build a spacecraft that is kind of powered from Earth? And one idea would be, okay, we just take a really strong laser on Earth, point it on a spacecraft, build a really small spacecraft that's propelled by this light, and then just continuously shoot at it to accelerate it to bring it to another star system. And um, actually, I don't know what, what the speed they want to achieve is, but I think they aim for a much higher speed than conventional rockets can reach. Yeah, I think they, on some of the more optimistic models, it was uh, several tens of percent of the speed of light, so something about 20%. Oh, that's, that's really impressive. Yeah. So yeah, also when you get close to the speed of light, you always have the problem that, of course, you require more and more energy to get closer and closer to the speed of light. This effect doesn't really apply like if you are below 10% or below, maybe below 50%, not even that much. But if you get kind of close, it gets really, really expensive to get uh, faster. So speed of light is, of course, a fundamental distance. And we don't, didn't find any way yet to get around the speed of light. Um, so unless that happens, it will take at least a few years to get to another star, to the closest star. And a few tens of years, I guess, to get to, to, to more, st uh, more stars. Yeah, maybe we should try first to fly around in our solar system again before we go to different stars. Yeah, so we have about about eight minutes left, so in case you want to ask some question, uh, maybe do it soon. Um, you're welcome to ask uh, questions. I'll just check the live streams if there are any questions we, mi we missed. 
And meanwhile, maybe uh, do you want to talk some about something like uh, the, the evolution of, st of stars? Maybe how d like we've talked about the what giant uh, did the kind of star evolution before, but we didn't really go into why the star evolved like this. So I'll mm -hmm. open the picture again with the uh, Hasbrung Russell yeah, diagram. Um, do, you, do you have a do you have a cross section of a star picture? Oh no, I don't have do it. Okay, I have That's a I have a picture funny. of the sun in like X-ray. Uh, that's just going to be a blob, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, we'll, we'll stick with the HLD then, I think. Um, yeah, so I guess the the very rough overview of stellar evolution is that uh, most of the, the way a star evolves depends on what's happening in its in its core, right, in its central regions. And um, you, you might know that the, the energy source of stars is converting mostly hydrogen into helium. And uh, this, this process is called nuclear fusion or nuclear synthesis sometimes. And this is what provides the, the energy source for all stars for most of their lives. And so stars spend about 90% of their lives gradually building up uh, a core of helium that is basically the ash left over from this burning. And that, that's what we call the main sequence. So it spends, yeah, spends its time there. Um, eventually what will happen is this layer of helium will be well this ball of helium will become sufficiently dense that it sort of blocks out the hydrogen and the uh the burning now takes place around the edge of the ball which we call shell burning and this is what describes the red giant the red giant branch then we we already mentioned the helium flash eventually as the star gets uh brighter and brighter and well it actually gets cooler but the core is getting hotter eventually this uh the core made of helium will ignite and this is basically just like a bomb going off in the center of your star. So, so the brightness of the helium burning depends on the temperature uh, to the power of 40. So if you double the temperature, uh, it goes the, the rate of the reaction goes up by a factor of a trillion. So it, it just it blows up. Um, but this is happening in the center of your star, so it's sort of contained, and we don't actually see this explosion. Um, but this signals the start of um, yeah of helium burning in the star, and we in most stars uh, below about eight times the mass of the sun, the the penultimate stage will be you have the the core which is uh, uh, helium burning, then you'll have a layer of helium on top of it, then you'll have a layer of hydrogen burning, and then the whole envelope on top of that which is just made of hydrogen. And this is what we call an, an asymptotic giant branch star. So this is the biggest most stars like like the sun will get. They'll, they'll, it'll swell up to around uh, two, 200 to 300 times the current size of the sun, uh, which will be probably enough to swallow the Earth. But, well, we'll see. <laughs> um, and then eventually, at the end of that stage, the, the envelope, which is so spread out now, it's very only very very weakly held onto the star, so the uh, the pulsations in the envelope are actually just enough to blow it away, and you end up with the just the remnants of the core, which we call a white dwarf, and so this is most of the mass of, of the original star, just probably just over half of the mass, but condensed down into an object that's only the size of the Earth, so they're very 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 dense objects, uh, not quite as dense as a neutron star, but like the next best thing. <laughs> What's what's different in the in the more massive stars, more more massive than we typically draw the line at about eight times the sun, is they won't stop at helium burning. They'll move on to burning other elements. So within this this core, so we have the the envelope of hydrogen, the hydrogen burning layer, the helium layer, the helium burning layer, and then inside of that you'll get a ball of carbon that starts to build up, and the carbon gets converted into neon, the neon to silicon, the silicon to iron. And once the star starts building up a layer of iron in its core, it only has a day left to live wow. uh, because it cannot extract any more energy from it. And so the, the pressure on this iron core continues to build until eventually it crushes the nuclei themselves into just well, what would become a neutron star if, if it's in the right mass range. Uh, this releases a huge amount of energy and it just blasts the rest of the star apart. As a, as a core collapse supernova. And so if, if you've got uh, like a, a, mass, a star that's on the low end of that mass range, so 8 to 20-ish uh, solar masses, you'll get a neutron star. Uh, beyond that, you'll probably get a black hole. 
that there are um, other interesting kinds of supernovae that can happen uh, depending on the mass of the star, and some of them just completely blast the star apart, leaving nothing behind. Wow. Yeah, I, th so, yeah, I think those are the rare ones. <laughs> I, I think like when you when when I thought about stars, like before I got like had the course in, course in my um, you know, in in my in my uh, astronomy course. Uh, I, I thought like, well, it's just like a bunch of gas, and it will just do a fusion and, and burn. Like, where's it from? And then like, when when I when I learned this, it's like, wow, it's like so many different things. Like, there's there's a shell going on, then the shell is burning, then this is burning, and then different elements like are getting created, and that's really. And there's still a lot of unsolved problems in exactly how this goes on within stars. So there are huge issues with well, not huge issues. There are issues <laughs> with things like um, convection of the star. So the the star's envelope kind of it convects like a, a boiling pot of water. Uh, we don't fully understand exactly how to treat that in our models. Uh, and also diffusion as well. So there's various kinds of mixing happen within the star to transport various elements around. And then as, as you'd expect, that's very important for describing how, uh, how, the, how the hydrogen burns, for example. So it depends on where the hydrogen is. It depends, uh, it affects things like the properties of the envelope. If it's made of a different material, then it will react differently. So yeah, there's there's still a lot going on, <laughs> a lot left yeah. to do. And then there's still the stars I'm interested in because I want to know what did the first very first stars in the universe do, and as far as we know, they are well, much much bigger than the stars we have now. So there's a whole new class of stars to explore uh, once we know something about them. So that will be uh, a big topic. Um, actually, yeah, maybe we we can qu quickly uh, say something about about the solar system and actually why supernovae. We just talked about them. Uh, are, are so important or why they are responsible for almost all of the elements that we have. Because mm. from the Big Bang, um, yes, it was a huge explosion, but it wasn't that hot and it was kind of efficient. So all it made was um, um, hydrogen and helium. That's, that's all the elements that were created. Um, maybe a bit of lithium, like a really tiny amount, but, but that's all that was created from, from uh, the Big Bang. And then the stars, it, like, um, the most energy efficient way for them to kind of fuse elements together would be to fuse everything to iron. Because if you fuse stuff up to iron, you would gain energy. But if you wanted to fuse stars to bigger things than iron, then you would have to add energy. So that's not really an, a process that a star would do to gain energy. That's not a process that would happen, like kind of voluntarily. And that's also why you can gain energy either by fusion, by fusing light elements to heavier ones, so like helium to, to maybe lithium or, or higher ones, or by... Um, Spe um, breaking up big elements like uranium into smaller ones, um, but kind of not the other ways around. So all the elements that are heavier than um, more or less like like iron, you cannot create or you don't usually create in normal stars, but you need supernovas to create them. And only there, like all the heavy elements that we find on Earth, um, get created. Which is kind of what you see in this chart here. So, so there, there, are, there are a few exceptions on the chart, which are the yellow ones. And you see these are labeled as dying low mass stars. So this means um, things that don't occur in supernovae, but are related to a process that happens on, on the, the AGB that I mentioned, the asymptotic giant branch. So this is the right at the end of, of a low mass star's life. And um, essentially what, you, what happens is a, a thing called S process neutron capture. Uh, the S stands for slow because it's not an explosion. And basically what you have here is uh, you're in the right conditions, which is right towards the center of the star next to what will become the white dwarf. Uh, you can add neutrons to the nu nuclei of the atoms there. And doing this, you can gradually build up to the larger and larger elements, even if it does cost you a little bit of energy. Um, but usually you find this, this is concentrated in certain elements. Like it's, you get a few up at the top, you get the carbon and the nitrogen from this. Mm. Um, you get nothing on the next two rows so and no, no oxygen. <laughs> Sorry. No oxygen. Uh, nope. Um, yeah, and you get you get those later ones. Um, but I think those are generally fairly rare elements. Looking at them, you don't get very much of them. Yeah. So all the oxygen, all the oxygen we breathe in has been created in a supernova, right? Uh, yes, that's yeah. it probably looks, mostly. It looks you, like you a can green make it in stars, chart. but it will it will tend to. Um, it'll tend to end up stuck in the white dwarf at the end. Ah, okay. But, but all, all of those elements shaded in yellow are the ones that are blown away inside the envelope. Mm. Okay. Yeah, uh, thanks a lot for, for all, the, all the answering of the questions, Tom. And thanks yeah. a lot for all our viewers to asking questions and, and for yeah, watching for this. this live stream. And we'll be back uh, next week 
uh, Monday evening, uh, same time, same places. Um, you can follow us on uh, Twitter, on, on YouTube, or the other platforms if you want to not miss uh, the next index announcement. So uh, you're welcome to join again next week and also welcome to answer us, uh, to ask questions in, in advance if you want. You can tweet them to us. You can see them, uh, put them on the website that's um, linked in the, here at the top. And um, yeah, it was uh, very nice and see you all uh, hopefully next 